Given what you've just heard, if you had three different schools that all had preferences in admissions, let's say one is, uh, let's just take Harvard. Sorry, Shirley. And Harvard applies a 10% preference. That is, a black applicant's 10% more likely to be admitted over a similarly situ situated white comparative. Then let's go to my alma mater, Cornell. Let's say Cornell grants a 20% preference. You're 20% more likely to be admitted if you're black over a similarly situated white comparative. And then let's take, I don't know, let's take Princeton. Let's say at Princeton, you're 100% more likely to be admitted if you're black than your similarly situated white comparative. Show of hands, how many of you think Harvard's admission program should be unlawful, the 10% advantage, under the Grutter and Graz? Uh, we got maybe a quarter, not even that, about a fifth of you. All right, we go to Cornell, 20% more likely to be admitted. How many of you think that should be unlawful? Uh, a lot more of you, maybe two thirds. And how about uh, the third one, Princeton, 100% more likely. Virtually everybody, although there are a few holdouts. If you had sat on the Supreme Court, every single one of you would have outlawed every single admissions program involving preferences throughout the country. Because the preferences aren't a 20% advantage, a 10% advantage, or not a 100% advantage. At the University of Michigan, it was 17,400%. At some schools, the advantage, and I thank Linda and her organization for this, at some schools, the odds of being admitted over a similarly situated, a black ad admittee over a similarly situated white comparative are 700 to one. That's not a feather on the scale, that's an anvil. Who does that help? I don't know. Now let me get back to my script because the high wire act's getting kind of dizzy. <laughs> let me just cite a few things going back to the guts of what we're talking about in terms of whether or not affirmative action will probably be um, uh, at least kept on the same pace. I think some of us really believe that. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out to what extent in the previous administration, although the previous president appointed me three different times, love him to death, but the administration didn't a whole, do a whole lot about dialing back affirmative action. All right, just take a look at the Grutter brief. Didn't see that. There are at least two major indices why I think the Obama administration is going to embrace affirmative action wholeheartedly and already has a instant intent to. One is personnel equals policy. You've heard about some of the personnel that he's either nominated or appointed. Um, the two most prominent ones, of course, being Judge Sotomayor, and that brings me to my other friend, Lieutenant Ben Vargas, who also testified in the Sotomayor hearing. Sat right next to him, learned a lot. He's not white, he's Hispanic. Guess what? He was one of the plaintiffs in the Ritchie case. How did that happen? I just thought it was bad white guys who got the advantage in disparate impact theory. Okay? But you have Mr. Perez uh, and uh, Ju Justice Sotomayor, I think indicates the direction in which the uh, administration might go. Also, Ms. Wilcher indicated that there's increased funding at both the Civil Rights Division and EEOC, significant amount. We're talking about an 18% increase in one year. We're talking about $23 million of the EEOC itself, and they've already announced an intent to increase the focus on disparate impact um, litigation. President Obama, when he was a senator, opposed the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative. That only says that there will not be any discrimination on the basis of race, sex, color, age, uh, uh, race, color, national origin, in contracting or employment, I don't know, that doesn't seem to be too controversial, but he had actually broadcast ads against it. Look at the Ritchie brief that the administration authored. It took the very expansive view that if a city such as New Haven had a reasonable belief that it would violate Title VII or had liability under Title VII, due to the disparate impact that its test might have, it was okay to throw out the test, as opposed to the Supreme Court's strong basis and evidence standard. And I'm about to get the hook, so let me just cite a few more. There are preferences thrown <clears throat> throughout healthcare legislation. I didn't read the entire 2,000 pages, 
But the original H.R. 3200, Linda mentioned a couple of provisions, preferences throughout. The Akaka bill that would establish a race-based government for Native Hawaiians in the state of Hawaii and grant preferences there too. The Senior Executive Service Diversity Assurance Act that would have a panel to assure diversity in the Senior Executive Service of the federal government. And my friend, another friend of mine, um, Roger Clegg and I spent a whole lot of useless hours reviewing the Federal Register daily. And at least once every other day, we see something in there promoting preferences of some sort. Usually on a minor matter, Roger reminded me that the Peanut Advisory Board has preferences. <laughs> this is important. But um, cumulatively, it starts to have an effect. Well, in any event, I think that we can expect that the preferences that are pervasive, they've been, become so pervasive that we don't even notice anymore, will continue, will pertain throughout this particular administration. Thank you.